very good morning to all of you. I, Akriti Kumari, on behalf of CII, would like to welcome everyone to the first webinar of the CII series of webinars on Industry 4.0 for India. The topic of for today's session is the importance of cable testing in industrial automation systems. The session is brought to you by our partner, Fluke Net Network. I would like to welcome our esteemed panelists for today's session, Mr. Wayne Allen, Asia Pacific uh, Regional Marketing Engineer, Loop Network. A very warm welcome to all the participants. Before we begin with the session, I would request the participants to post their questions in the Q&A section. The questions would be taken up by our panelists one by one at the end. I would also request our panelists to kindly keep themselves on mute when they are not speaking. So without further ado, let's begin with today's session. I would request Mr. Allen to kindly begin the session. Over to you, please. Okay, if you could pass me. Yes, sure. Okay, good morning everyone, and hopefully my presentation is now showing. Yes, we can see. Okay, well thank you for the opportunity this morning to present. Uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of uh, table testing in industrial automation systems. So that works as been around for nearly 30 years. Uh, it's, we're part of the Fluke organization. And some of the biggest organizations in the world rely on our products to keep their systems up and running. Our customers are across large part of the world, whether they be installing data communication cables, cabling in data centers, cabling for communications, and cabling for control engineers, electricians, Alan, your voice is not clear. We can't hear you. It's uh, actually cutting in. Between. Okay, I don't understand why. How, how's that? Because I'm on a full headset. Mm, now it's gone. You can proceed. We'll let you know. Okay, it could be the communications out of Australia to uh, India. So we'll just persevere. So please let me know if it starts. Yeah, sure, sure. We'll let you know. With industrial automation, what we are seeing today is industrial e-commerce taking over from traditional bus style or field bus style communication media. At the moment, courtesy of HMS's research, Industrial Ethernet has about 64% market share, whereas more traditional field bus systems has around about 30% market share and is declining. Here in Asia, Profinet and Ethernet IP is where our focus is followed still by Profi bus systems. And if we look at industrial Ethernet over the past decade, it has been growing immensely, replacing what we call traditional bus. There are a number of um, different research 
showing the growth. It's around about 9 or 10 percent compound annual growth. Why? Industrial ethernet, it seems, is a universal solution for manufacturing. What's key is it allows one form of communication across the No longer do we have production networks, can be office or traditional office networks. They're no longer separate companies. Sorry to interrupt you, Ellen. Uh, we can't hear you. It means just, it's not clear. Okay, I think we've got a bandwidth issue. Um, it's raining heavily in Australia at the moment. Oh. Yeah, because your voice is coming very low and it's not very really clear. Okay, how about if I speak up like this? Is that better? Mm, I don't think. Can you speak something now? How's that now? See, when you are speaking small lines, then it's okay. But when you are going in continuation, it, it is breaking. Okay, we'll change the style. So we're talking about Ethernet taking over from traditional areas. Ethernet is trusted. It's easy. If you look at traditional manufacturing and automation, sometimes we have multiple bus style technologies and that becomes difficult for the maintenance people to maintain. When we look at cabling, cabling is the foundation of industrial internet system. Whether your cabling is pre-terminated or field terminated, when we talk to industry sources, we find that cabling usually contributes around about 50% of the cost. Getting the length wrong. Getting the termination on connectors incorrect. Cabling issues. All give problems in the environment. And if we look at noise emitted cables, that could also be the problem. Anshan, I'm getting a dropout in WebEx. Are you seeing me drop out? Is, is our host still there? Hello? I seem to have lost WebEx. Uh, Ellen? Uh, are you using earphones? No, I'm using a computer network, but I'm losing connection. Computer, uh, speaker. No, I'm on a headset. 
Uh, can you just remove the headset because uh, and just try for once uh, without the headset? Hello. Yeah, Ellen, we can't hear you if you are speaking. Ellen, you are on mute. We cannot hear you. Right. How's that? Yeah, now it's good. Now it's good. Yep. I just had to remove um, the headset yeah, for some reason. Okay. Now you can go ahead. Okay, let's see how this goes. I've yes. just removed the headset. Okay. No. No. Sorry about that, everyone. We've just changed the headset to um, see if it gives a better result. Okay, going back to where we were. Cabling is over 50% of industrial Ethernet problems. Whether your cabling is pre-terminated or field terminated, we are seeing problems with length, connectors, or the cable type being used. And one of the areas of problems indicated was noise in the cables. And if you look at noise entering a cable, that could actually be a cabling problem as I'll share with you later. There are standards based around testing. Uh, the American TIA Association has a set of standards and so does the equivalent ISO group or committee. And, and both standards groups have some very specific standards that show you how to do industrial automation cabling correctly, whether it's um, shielded cable four pair, shielded cable two pair. There is guidance out there on how to do things correctly. And from the IEEE, the Profinet people, the ODVA people, or the Modbus people, they also have guidance documents that will help you cabling correctly. Because I, I can't stress enough that as you move your communications across to Ethernet, you need to make certain the cabling is good. It is the foundation of your network. So people ask us why we should be testing. Yeah, I, I, I get the question every day, Wayne, why should we be testing the cabling? And my response is, is usually, well, the cabling is the foundation of your network. It will outlast your electronics. So for a production or industrial automation environment, 
your PLCs, your switches, your HMIs, your VFDs and your PCs will all be replaced over the life of the cabling. So doing it correctly the first time round means you don't have to repair later or you're not looking at removing and replacing cabling, which is very expensive and, and very disruptive. So if you're installing the equipment, it's just good practice to check that what you or your technicians have done has been done correctly. And also, it's a little bit of protection against post-installation damage or tampering. If you're the consultant that designed the system, you want to ensure that what was installed met your client's brief and it meets the OEM vendor's requirements for warranty. If you're the plant engineer, how can I ensure that my cabling solution will deliver on its promise? How can you ensure you've been supplied with real cabling products and not fake products? There's a lot, a lot of fake cabling products on the market out there these days. And you want maximum life out of your cabling plant. You don't want to be replacing it all the time. And if you're the manufacturer, you're the one supplying the warranty that your system, your machinery is going to work correctly. You need um, to make certain that you have confidence in the job that's been done. So from a high level, if your cabling's not good, you're going to experience long startup times. And it could take days of wasted time just to try and get equipment to talk correctly. And that could have been avoided if you had eliminated cabling first time round. And if you're doing ads, moves and changes in an operating production network and the cabling is wrong, your whole production line goes down. And that could mean you've got people standing around waiting. And with production environments, it's not a nice clean environment like an office environment. You're experiencing moisture, vibration, contamination, and devices that create EMI. So you're also faced with a lot of intermittent problems resulting in product outrage. And no matter where you are and what you're building, when you can't produce, that is money lost. So let me give you an example. This is an automotive manufacturer. Uh, we were visiting their plant. So this is actually a real world example. And we asked them, how do they measure lost revenue? And they have a very simple formula. How many trucks they make an hour? How much money do they earn per truck or per vehicle? And the numbers of hours production is down equals the cost of downtime. So if they lost an hour, each vehicle cost $40,000. They made six, six vehicles an hour. They were looking at nearly a quarter of a million dollars per one hour of outage. And the example that we came across is they had a production down. They assumed they had a cabling problem. They didn't test, they just assumed they had a cabling problem. So they had to find their bypass cable and they had to safely install that bypass cable. And it took over an hour. The bypass 
didn't fix the problem. So they've already wasted an hour. If they had it tested, they would have found in less than 10 minutes that it wasn't the cabling causing the issue. They would have saved themselves over $200,000. It was a big eye opener for this company. So for this manufacturer, testing correctly paid for itself in a few minutes of saved downtime. But even if you're making something as simple as bottling milk or something very dear to my heart, bottling beer, um, the appropriate test instruments will pay for themselves quickly in this sort of environment. And I think what we all understand and, and need to realise is industrial environments need excellent cabling. Too many times we see people try to use standard office style cabling in industrial environments and run into problems. There's something that we call in our industry MICE, M-I-C-E, mechanical, so the cabling's got to withstand vibration and flexing. Ingress, the cabling installation's got to withstand water, wash down and chemical exposure. Climatic, high and low temperature ranges, especially high temperature ranges are detrimental to standard office style cabling. And the big one is EMI, electromagnetic noise. And if you look at how MICE is dealt with within the international standards, whether it's ISO or TIA, or even in individual organisations guidance documents, zone three is very electrically noisy. Typically in those environments, high voltages, variable frequency drives, motors, welding, access switches mounted on equipment, it's not a very friendly environment for networking. Zone one's the office environment. That's pretty straightforward. And we consider zone two between zone one and zone three. So how do you reduce those cabling problems? How do you minimize them? You will never get rid of them. But you will be able to minimise them. You test, or if you want to use some other terminologies there, verify or validate that the cabling is good and the cabling standards are met. That gives you the best chance of the cable working correctly in environments where there's high vibration, high levels of moisture, temperature, electrical and magnetic noise. Test it to a standard, that's the ideal. But no matter what you do, test it to some level. Performance of network cabling relies on the quality of the components used and importantly, the installation workmanship. Cabling systems include the wire, and it could be fibre. There's a lot of fibre optics creeping into the industrial automation environment. And making certain that the connectors at the ends and the connectors in the path, the interconnects of the bulkheads as we call them, have all been done correctly. And just to give you an example, captured a trace off an oscilloscope where we were having a problem. And this is noise from a variable frequency drive. So we had our control of the uh, drive, but over the top we could see high energy pulses and an electrical noise. So we were running in an E2, E3 and environment. And how this gets in, into data cable, I've got a little diagram there at the bottom. Ethernet uses what we call differential mode. 
And if your balance, your RF balance of the cable is poor, the noise is not cancelled out correctly by the twisting of the pair. And so the output has got a spike of noise on it. And if you test cables correctly while they're being installed, you can use what we call a TCL measurement or a, an ELTCTL measurement, and you can assess the cabling for noise immunity to an E1, E2, or E3 level. And if you look at the different industrial automation guides from the different industry groups, whether it be um, Modbus or whether it be Ether, Ethernet IP or VA, they'll all give you guidance on what cables to use where with respect to mice ratings of cables. So it's a very important part of a, in a manufacturing plant to make certain you use the right cable in the right place. So when should you be validating or verifying that cable? During assembly, of course, if it's a part of a production line being assembled by a manufacturer, this will make certain the connectors are wired correctly, shielding is done correctly, uh, make certain there's no untwists. A lot of people make the mistake of untwisting the wire too much when putting terminations on the cable. Um, that leaves your connections susceptible to noise. Um, make certain the cable losses are within their limits. And as equipment's being brought into the plant, so we're in the installation phase, check again. Check the cables between the manufacturing islands. Because what you want to achieve by making certain everything is tested correctly is you're avoiding startup delays. And if you've eliminated the cabling system, you've taken it out. And make certain when things are being built, if you're buying from a machine builder or an original equipment manufacturer, they can supply you with documentation. And again, as that machinery is often reassembled when it gets to the plant, make certain it's checked again. And please document everything. It is very hard for a technician to fix a problem quickly when things aren't documented properly in the first place. Remember, what we're trying to avoid here is startup delays, and startup delays cost you money. And when things go wrong and you've got to troubleshoot, as we saw in the example area, production downtime can be expensive. So you want to be able to very quickly isolate a problem. Cables will and do fail. I actually had to talk to a customer this morning who had a failed cable controlling an industrial robot. Vibration, moisture, heat. Wash down if it's a food and beverage plant or a pharmaceutical plant. Exposed connections, they get damaged. It's not difficult to test a cable. You can go end to end in less than a minute. If the cable's good, hey, it's eliminated and you don't have to find a bypass cable and install a bypass cable, only to find that didn't fix the problem. If the cable was bad, well, you know it's bad, and good test equipment will say, hey, it's bad, and your problem is here. You will know where the problem is. So again, you're saving time, effort in doing so. So how do we determine if cable is wired properly? So I've got an example here to the right. 
where we've taken the patch cords from the industrial switch and from the variable frequency drive. And we can see, do all the wires go through? Is there a problem? So in this case, we can see that one wire has come up a little bit short. It's only at 75% of the 75 meters. So that's telling us we've got a damage in the cable or the cable's damaged at around about 57 meters. In this example, the field test is telling us that wires five and six are shorted about halfway down the cable. So that's telling us we've probably got a problem here where the two cables are joined. One of the big problems is one tech technician wiring at this end may be using the 568A wiring code. But the technician at the far end, he may have wired one of these terminations as 56B code. So the tester will indicate that there is a level of wiring error there. This may be okay if it's a crossover cable, so just be careful. If someone has split a pair, and this is not uncommon if you're hand terminating RJ45s. They are difficult to terminate in the field. You can split a pair. And a good tester will indicate by flashing here, where I've got my indicator, that you've split the pairs. By the way, low cost LED wire map tools won't find this sort of a problem. This is a, a frequency detected that will cause you near and crosstalk. This, is, uh, this was an interesting one to us. This is another real world example of what damage a cable can cause if it's not done correctly. This is a wind farm generating power. The controlling PLC was indicating network faults all the time. So intermittently, the power generation company was getting a machine shut down. So it wasn't able to deliver its commitment. So there's a loss of productivity because we weren't generating the power. And because of the remoteness, the technician had to visit very many times and couldn't isolate what was going on. Unfortunately, the cabling wasn't tested when this was installed. And they have fiber optic links and they have copper links between equipment. And they found this particular cable here wasn't tested. It was defective. It actually had that split pair that I showed you previously. So someone had, hadn't checked that they used the right cable, hadn't checked the cable, it's bringing the wind, wind turbine farm down. The, think of what that was costing the supplier of energy because they weren't able to generate when this was happening. You can take your testing from the very simple ex examples I just showed you, which is what we would consider a basic level of testing, and you can all the, go all the way up to a high level of testing. And this is very typical that, of what is used in the ICT industry and also used in very large plant installation where there is quite a lot of cabling. And here we're using a cabling analog. So that only does one of these tools show you whether the cabling is good or bad. An example I have here is an, another form of split pair. Uh, it's a pretty horrendous form of failure, especially if you're using a gigabit ethernet, as this customer was. So not only do you get the basic 
checks on the cable. It'll also allow you to look at the attenuation in the cable or what we call insertion loss. And insertion loss can fail with length, frequency and temperature. So you might have a plant that works in the cool of the morning, but in the heat of the day, things start going wrong. It could be that the cable is not able to withstand the higher temperatures because it's longer in length. So we will look for insertion loss, return loss and crosstalk in a cable. All stop, all these problems can stop a cable from working. And if we have a return loss issue, that could be caused by water in a cable. Yeah, a washdown environment where we're manufacturing food or pharmaceuticals. If you use a cable designed for an office environment, even though it has a plastic jacket, it's not waterproof. It's water repellent. You, if you're going to it, a standard office style cable is not IP67 rated. So when water gets in, it changes the dielectric constant of the cable and you get return loss failures. So here's a way of diagnosing water failed cables. Resistance, if you've got resistance issues, that will result in flaky connections. Vibration, the communications becoming intermittent when machines are operating. If you've got higher resistance as we have here in um, this example, it could indicate a workmanship issue where the connectors weren't installed co correctly. And we typically look at these sort of problems down to the milliohm level. And if you suspect you've got EMI issues with your cabling, you can run what we call a TCL measurement. And it will show you where the problem is with your cabling. And in this particular case, we've got pair seven, eight, the brown pair failing. I won't go into the, the physics that creates the problem, but if a cable is poorly designed or of the wrong type of cable or not installed correctly, it allows EMI to get in. And typically if we're testing the cabling systems and the machinery is not running, so we don't know, but measuring TCL is a preventative step to make certain you have a level of EMI rejection built into the cabling plant. So the better the TCL, the better the noise immunity of the cabling. And in fact, when a system is operating, EMI is a very, very difficult problem to chase down because it's often intermittent. And when you've got connectivity out there, even with a simple tester, you can do the basic checking. You can plug a simple tester into the industrial ethernet switch, set it running, and it will tell you what is there. And in this particular case, we can see that the switch is offering up a gigabit. But you may be operating at 10 megabit, 100 megabit, or a gigabit. Switches are capable of those three speeds. If we're relying on power being provided by the switch to operate the device on the end of the cabling, you can check that as well. These tools will, will plug in, talk to the switch and tell it to offer power as well. And in this case, the switch port is not only offering a gigabit of ethernet, it's also offering 13 watts of power over ethernet. And you might be using that to power a wireless access point. 
or an inspection camera or some sort of video inspection system on the production line. You can repeat that at the other end of the cabling as well. So you can look at the speed and the power on over Ethernet at the other end of the cable. Do I have a difference between the switch port and the end of the cable? So you have the ability, even with a simple tool, to do the right level of troubleshooting. And with power over Ethernet today, what you are going to see in industrial automation is the ability for the data cable to drive higher powered equipment. So you can have 62 watts of power right out to 90 watts of power being offered by the network switches. The network switches can also do what we call split power or dual signature. One pair can drive one part of the device. In this case, 40 watts of energy on one pair of cables. And on the other pair of cables, pair 4578, that's providing 25.5 watts on demand as another part of the equipment asks for more energy. So this very sophisticated level of power management now becoming available. And you can also have passive devices out there in your environment. And we come across these typically in some of the um, sensor environments where you can use an external injection onto the data cable to provide a voltage. And in this case, a fixed voltage of 24 volts to drive a device. So with the right tools, you can very, very quickly look at your copper cabling and ascertain whether it's good or bad and eliminate that from your plant troubleshooting. Just to finish up here, I'd like to also cover off a little bit on fiber optics because we're using more fiber optics today. Inspection or cleaning connectors is very important. Dirt is 80% of all of fiber optic problems today, just dirty connectors. Just being plugged in and used, dirt gets onto connectors. And just because something's newly installed doesn't mean it is clean. Here's a connect, set of connectors brand new out of their packaging. Put them under the microscope, you can actually see that the connector is filthy. So you clean it. So there are plenty of cleaning tools available. Fluke Networks has uh, the quick clean Click cleaners for cleaning connectors. As you can see, we cleaned up most of the connector, but you've got to inspect again, just to make certain there's no dust hanging around. As you can see, the dust left. So another clean will remove that dust. So just because something's new, doesn't mean it's clean. And every time you're patching up fiber optics, Make certain you clean and inspect. Probably the best troubleshooting tool for industrial automation is the OTDR. It's a great troubleshooting tool. It can find a poor connection, a bad splice, and it can find a break in the cable for you. Here's a typical OTDR. And as they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. We can see a lot about a cable from here. At point A, that's where the signal's coming out of the OTDR. At point B, that's our first connection. So between A and B is our launch cord. At C, you can see like a double hump. That's two connections very close together. At point D, 
that's a fusion splice. You can see the drop off. At point E, that's a typical UPC, ultra physical contact fiber optic connection, so a standard connection. We call this a reflective event. The pulse going up says it's a reflection. Where at D, the pulse, there was no pulse, it just dropped off. That says it's non reflective, so therefore normally a splice. Point F is interesting. Instead of going down, it goes up, so we've got a gain. This tells us there's probably a fiber mismatch at this connection. And at point G, we can see the end or the break in the fiber. I want to zoom in a little bit here. I want to have a look at this connection. I'll bring that up. The distance be or the difference here between those two right red lines, that's the loss in, in the connector. In this case, about 1.25 dB. That's too high. We really only should be seeing 0.75 of a dB. The other bit of information available to us here, which is very important, is the height of the pulse. That's the reflectance of the connector. This is quite low, so this connector is clean. If this pulse is really high, getting up over 10 towards 15 and 20 dB, that would be an indication that that connector was dirty and you would need to clean that mated connection. So the OTDR is really a great tool for troubleshooting a fiber optic network. And if you don't believe me, these guys run a mining operation. This is another real world example. They only have 14 fibers across this plant. So yeah, you think these guys were crazy investing in an OTDR for just 14 fibers? Think about your fibers in your plant. These guys did. The plant's operating in a remote location. They were relying on a third party technician to deal with their fiber optics. It could take him three or four days to come to site and the drive was 90 minutes from the nearest town. Every hour their fiber was down, they were losing money. And this is a tough environment. Temperature extremes, dirt and dust, all take its toll on fiber optic installs. So the company decided investing in the right tools and doing the fault finding themselves made sense. And they reduced their downtime. They had quick fault isolation. They had no external technician charges. The instrument paid for was paid for with the reduction in regular production outings. And they, they, they had re regular downtime because of fiber optics. And they still get regular downtime. But instead of taking days to recover, it's now less than an hour to find out what has gone wrong. So what I have for you is a checklist. Some things that you can look at yourself with testing. Is the cable connector wired properly? That's the first basic. The cable too long. We often see in industrial automation, they exceed the 100 meters at 20 degree channel length. And if you're in a warmer environment, you actually, not a lot of people realize you can't run data cabling for 100 meters. And typically if you're getting up around 40, 45 degrees centigrade, your data cabling doesn't work very well past about 75 meters. So you need to just keep an eye on cable lengths. And if, if the vendor or the installer, the technician says it was tested, did it pass a recognized test standard? Not just what someone says was okay, but an independent um, 
judgment of whether that cable was good or bad. And what cable are you using? And what MyStone are you running this cabling in? It, does that all work it out? Are you trying to use office grade cabling in a zone three environment? That's just asking for, for problems. And with fiber optics, did you inspect both ends of the cable and the connectors? Were they clean? What is the fiber type? What application is being run? How long is the run? Fiber does have length limits on it depending on the application. A lot of people forget that. And as a rule of thumb, you don't want to see a fiber connection with over 0.5 of a dB of loss. And if someone's using our equipment, ask them to send you a report. Get a report out on what that cable looks like, whether it's good or bad. You've got some documentation there to support your cabling. Flip networks can help you. We have a whole website set up. It's free to, for anyone to use. And as you can see there, maximize, how to maximize your industrial ethernet uptime. On the site, you will find a lot of documentation on testing cabling. We have a free poster on what your wiring should look like and how to test. And we have an interactive tool, what we call a test configuration tool on our website that will take you through step by step for this sort of cable, for this sort of connector, how to configure the equipment to correctly test that cable. Not only graphically, but you can print out a set of step-by-step -step instructions. And we have a technical support team globally. So they're available, we follow the sun. So to conclude, because I'm just up on my time, cabling used in your industrial plant is really the foundation of your control network. You need to build a robust foundation and use good quality components. Make certain you validate or certify the cable correctly. Reality, pair mapping alone is not good enough and can sometimes hide issues. But some form of testing is better than no testing. Over 50% of all industrial network issues are related to cabling. It just makes good sense to remove the cabling from the equation when you're commissioning new plant. Eliminating the cable first makes good sense when troubleshooting outages. And if you get an outage due to cabling, how much does that outage cost your company in loss production? Some people are horrified when they do the mathematics or the sums around loss production cost. And it can be tens of thousands of dollars for every hour you're out of production. And to be out of production just because you've got a bad cable is, is not good sense. Seek advice if you are unsure. Many suppliers have great guides for their products. Um, I've called out a few here, a um, few organisations there. They have all, all got guidance available on cabling. Do a bit of homework up front. Find out what best practice is. Um, Fluke Networks, we are considered the world leaders in cable testing. I just showed you the website. I know we can help. We're also an Encompass partner. So Rockwell Automation has chosen us as their cable testing partner. Um, 
we work closely with that organisation and we have guides available as I showed you earlier on how to do these things. So I'm certain we can, we can help you out, but also these other great suppliers can also help you out as well. If you're unsure, ask. We're only too happy to help. Well, that's it for me this afternoon. I'm, I'm on time. Um, my apologies for WebEx and sound earlier on. We changed um, the audio settings in WebEx, which seems to have fixed the problem. So I'm open to take any questions. So I can't see the chat line at the moment. So if someone could relay the questions across to me, that would be great. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for this information. Uh, so we can take a couple of questions quickly. Uh, so there's a question from Mr. Praveen Kumar. He wants to know, will proper shielding of cable make the cable compatible to EMI? Okay, what was that one? That was... Um... So it was about a shielded cable in EMI. Was is that? Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Shielded cable is great for preventing EMI, and highly recommended in industrial um, cabling environment. But only if the shields are installed correctly. And, and that's the key, because the, the idea of a shield is to form a Faraday cage around the twisted pairs. So no signal gets in and no signal gets out. But in the industrial environment, you have to be careful. When you ground at both ends, you have to avoid what we call a ground loop. So that, that takes careful consideration by the engineer or the technician and possibly the need to measure for any earth potential differences between the ends of the cable. But by and large, shielded cabling is more immune, well, not more immune, a lot more immune to EMI than unshielded cabling. So that's a great question. Um, uh, there's a question there on uh, measuring cable lengths. Um, most good quality meters will measure cable length for you. Uh, the one I showed there is, which is called the Microscanner, measures cable length. Uh, that was the Microscanner POE particularly, or our cable certification tools, our DSX series of cable analyzers will also um, measure cable length. Uh, someone's uh, asked about preferred good quality brands. Uh, I'd rather not get into that argument. That could be um, uh, that could be a he said um, he said type argument. So I'd rather avoid recommending a brand of cabling. But what I would say is ask your colleagues and do do some research there. Ask your supplier or ask the OEM vendor who they prefer as their cabling supplier. Were there any more questions there? Yes, so we have one more question from Mr. Shubham Dixit. He's asking how to make sure proper signal, signal length if length of the copper cable to be more than 100 meters. I think that was uh, making certain the, cup, the cable is less than 100 meters, was that correct? Pardon? I didn't quite get that. Um... I will read it once more. It's yep. how to make sure proper signaling if length of copper cable to be more than 100 meters. Okay. The, you can't exceed 100 meters in copper cabling. What happens when you start exceeding 100 meters, the insertion loss is too high. So therefore, the signal getting to the end of the cable is too low 
and the noise in the cable will be too high. It's called the signal to noise ratio. And when noise swamps signal, the receiving devices can't understand what's being sent. So one of the key measurements we do using what's called a time domain reflectometer, and most good cabling tools have that built, built in. It sends a pulse down the cable and times how long it takes for the pulse to come back. And we then calculate it out the length of the cable from there. So as long as you're below 100 metres end to end, you should be good. If you're longer than 100 metres, you're going to have a problem. If you can't avoid going past 100 metres, you can use up to about 105, 106 metres, depending on your protocol. But my recommendation there, instead of using a 24 AWG cable, would be to come up to a 22 or 22 and a half AWG cable, what we typically call a heavy duty category 6A cable in the industry or you could even go as far as a category eight cable. There is more copper on those in those cables, so the attenuation is less and you can get past the 100 meters. But as a design rule, please make certain you stay below that 100 meters and use a tool to verify that you are below 100 meters. Any more questions there? Yeah, uh, there's one more question. You can take this. Can uh, Mr. Uh, from Shomya Chakrabarti is asking, can you highlight on the testing domain for 5G based signal passing through C86 cable? Can you just repeat that one again? It dropped out a little bit. Uh, can you highlight on the testing domain for 5G based signal passing through CAT C6 cable. Cable passing, uh, signal passing through a cable at, at a higher through speed? Through a CAT C6 cable, CAT6 cable, signal passing CAT6 through. CAT6 cable, cable. Yeah. yeah. A CAT6 cable um, is of a higher quality than a Category 5E cable. Uh, so the speeds, are actually no different from Category 5e. A Category 5e is good for a giga, gigabit per second. A Category 6 cable is good for gigabit per second. However, with a Category 6 cable over shorter distances, you can go higher speeds. You can go 2.5 or 5 gig reasonably easily. Uh, you can, over shorter distance, and it really depends on the brand of cable. You can, between 35 and 50 metres, run 10 gigabit on a CAT6 cable. But as a guide today, in the ICT world, our advice to people, if possible, install Category 6A cabling. It's more future proof and, and reality is not a lot of people are today installing Category 5e cabling. So if, for cabling today, my personal feeling is Category 6 should be the bare minimum because it just stands up a little bit better. And if you can afford it and you want plant longevity, have a look at CAT 6A cabling. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I think we can close the session for now because uh, as we have already exceeded the time. So I yep. if, there's, if there's any further questions, please email them to us. Um, yeah, sure. Email them to, to my team and, and colleagues in India and we'll personally answer those to those questions to the customers. So I would like to once again, thank you, uh, Mr. Allen, for uh, such an insightful session of yours. And would also like to thank our participants for making this session a success.
if uh, there is any feedback or any queries and if you would like to connect to fluke networks you can write back at uh, akriti.kumari at cii.in so thank you one and all okay thank you